Hi everyone, welcome to the Limitless Run Masterclass. Uh, I run for hope. Today we'll be talking about helping a friend, but before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Asher. I'm a social worker with Limitless. Um, I have about 10 years of experience, give or take, right? working with young people. Uh, and you know, really what I really believe is that you know, this generation of young people really have you know, an awesome capability to help each other. And I believe that, you know, for those of us who are a little bit older, we can kind of learn from that as well. And one thing that I always believe and kind of say, right, is that you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic, right? And we'll learn a little bit more about that today. But before I do that, let me introduce the Limitless Run, right? So the Limitless Run is a run that Limitless runs, <laughs> right, once a year. To kind of raise funds for our coming year. You know, in the last year, we've seen about 700-ish youths this year, um, of which 28% of them have struggled with suicidal ideation. And what we want to do, right, is really to continue to grow, right, um, our counseling team to be able to attend to every single person that reaches out to us for help. Yeah, so... If you want to connect with us, there are a few things you can do. You can reach us at hello at limitless.sg. If you are listening in right now or you're watching on YouTube and you kind of want to reach out to us, these are the places that you can reach us. So on Instagram as well at we.r.limitless and on TikTok at limitless.sg. Right, cool. So we have a very quick introduction to our app. Uh, our app's called A Day in the Life. And if you feel right that you are trying to explain to somebody what, what depression looks like, for example, especially like, you know, you're trying to explain to a mom or a parent or a dad or a teacher, you know, somebody who doesn't understand it, right? You can download this app. The QR code is in, uh, is on screen right now. And, you know, it will run you through a visual novel whereby you play a day in a life of a girl struggling with depression. Yeah. So if you are thinking of trying to explain, you know, mental health issues to another person, this is, you know, something that you can use. All right. Now, I was talking a little bit more about, you know, running for hope and, and, and supporting our cause and all that stuff, right? And, you know, if you are listening in or you're here today and you feel like you would like to support the work you know, beyond the limitless run, you know, you can feel free to go to give.asia slash limitless uh, and continue to support the work that we do. You know, all proceeds will go to these three things, you know, to our helpline whereby, you know, we provide some support, you know, for youth who are struggling with short-term issues, you know, to our casework and counseling portion, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on and to our mental health outreach. You know, it takes $65 to kind of pay for every hour intervention. You know, and basically it goes to our helpline in case of counseling. Where earlier on I mentioned about 28% of youths that we see struggle with depression. Oh, sorry, no, struggle with suicidal ideation. All right. So where's it go? Our helpline provides that short-term therapeutic support for youths who are in distress, meant by counselors, social workers, and trained train listeners, where we support them for up to three weeks, providing that support via, you know. WhatsApp, via video calls, via phone calls. And that also allows us to kind of reach in to do even deeper work if they need the help as well. Um, sometimes, right, you know, we see that and we notice that you know, maybe they wrote in for something that's not so serious, like, ah, uh, I just broke up with my boyfriend, you know, and I'm struggling. But sometimes we realize that even through those not so serious things, things can become even more severe, which brings us to our casework and counseling. All right, with our casework and counseling you know, portions provide that therapy. And that's where we see youths who struggle with deeper issues, like depression, anxiety, PTSD, right, abuse, suicidal ideation, you know, where we provide the support for them. And in fact, you know, we're one of the only organizations that do this, whereby we don't just meet them in the counseling room, but we meet them where they are as well. You know, and it's done by definitely qualified therapists. Like myself. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, not 
you know, we don't just do um, that counseling or therapy, but we also do the casework whereby we accompany them to hospitals, work with the police, work with their schools, their families, um, get them the help that they need, essentially. Yeah. So, if you feel that this is something that's worth kind of investing in and supporting our work, feel free to give, you know, us a, a monthly donation or, you know, even a one-time donation at giving, oh, sorry, give.asia slash limitless, right? That's give.asia slash limitless. All right, I'm going to begin, right? Helping a friend, helping a friend. I think the reality is that you know, for this generation, those of us who live in 2022, right? It's not if, but when I need to reach out to a friend. Doesn't matter whether or not you are 15 or you're 50, right? It's not if, but when we need to reach out for, to a friend. You know, in Singapore, the, the statistics tell us that one in seven Singaporeans will struggle with mental health issues in their lifetime, Right? And one in seven, we think about it, most of us have more than seven friends, right? You know, more than seven family members. You know, the reality is that it's not if, but when, you know, we will get the opportunity to reach out to be that person, right? That can stretch out our hand, right? And help that person in need. So when we think about it, right? How then do I do that? And that's the question I get the most, you know. Every time I do a talk, every time I do a, a, a program, Every time I go to school, this is the question that I get the most. I have a friend in need. How do I help them? All right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. So let's talk about when do I get help on behalf of a friend first? All right. Before anything else, when do I get help on behalf of a friend? When my friend is at risk of hurting themselves or others. When you feel really concerned about their behaviors or emotions. Right. And when you yourself are overwhelmed and don't know how to help. Right, and there is no shame, right, in reaching out to someone else to get help for a friend, you know, and definitely when they ask you to, right? But you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this, yeah. But what can you do to help your friend, right? So, the reason why I spoke about when to get help for a friend first, right, is first things first, we need to remember this that you are not the counselor, okay? <laughs> you are not the counselor, and what I do believe is this that if you are reaching out to a friend, if possible, don't do it alone. Do it with somebody else. Do it with a family member. Do it with another friend. Do it even with a professional. Right? And when you do that, right, you will allow yourself that breathing space to continue to be therapeutic to that friend rather than burning out. Okay? So, how do I help my friend then? First things first, we're going to talk about this thing called look, listen, and link. Right? But before that, you know, if you are tuning in today, right, yesterday, you know, I, my colleague Megan was talking about Mental Health 101, right? What is mental health? And, you know, if you're worried about thinking about what are the struggles to look for, how do I identify, you know, she has covered that. I'll cover it a little bit in a little while. But main thing first is this, that I want to kind of throw out a quick statistic. Yeah, one to two thirds of people, right? One to two thirds of people, especially young people, right, will never seek help for a mental health issue. One to two thirds. And we're thinking about one in seven people struggling with a mental health issue, that one to two thirds becomes a very, very large number. Yeah. And it takes people up to six years, statistically, six years to reach out for help. And by the time, right, six years, can you imagine, right, having the flu for six years, having stomach for six years, having food poisoning, you try that, right? It's very difficult. And when you think about it, right, the more it festers, the worse it gets. And it can get quite bad. So what we want to do is to also not just reach out to help a friend, but before that, to look out for the people around us, whether or not your parent, your, you know, a friend, your family member, your teacher, you know, your mentor, your somebody, right, who is in the vicinity of that person. You know, look out for that person. Yeah. So in the first place, are your friends safe? First question, 
Are they thinking of hurting themselves or someone else? Are they being hurt by someone else? These are big things that you want to look out for first. Right? Are your friends safe? Next, are they in distress? So when you think about these two things, right? Can I just tell you about a girl that I know? When she was younger, right? I knew her when she was, I think, you know, this happened when she was 16, you know, during her old level year. And, and one of the things that happened was that, you know, we did not know what was going on at home, but halfway in the middle of that old level year, she kind of like left her house. You know, she quote unquote ran away from home. You know, but she lives in a very complicated family situation. So she actually ran away, quote unquote ran away like from her from her mom and her stepfather's place to her biological father's place. And she did it very smart way. Like, you know, she was every time she visits him on the weekend, she'll bring over important things, her books, her laptop, right? Things that she cherishes, her passport. And the interesting thing is this that she never looked like she was struggling. She never did. Right, she never looked like she was struggling, and you know when we think about it, right, it was only much, much later that we found out that she was being abused by her father, you know, by by her, by her stepfather. So some of the things that we could have looked out, uh, you know, for at that point in time was, is she in distress? Has she spoken about wanting to leave the house? You know, does she feel like she's overwhelmed? You know, does she feel like there are things that are causing her to feel depressed, for example? Excuse me. You know, are they safe? Are they safe? Sometimes it's obvious. They'll tell you like, I want to hurt myself. You know, it's very clear. And, and can I just share about my own friend, right? My own friend that, that came in, right? You know, there was one day I was on holiday, okay? And this guy dropped me a message saying, Asher, I think my friend wants to kill herself. I'm like, what? Tell me more, right? What is going on here, right? And, you know, this guy can, can, kind of just told me that, you know, these are the things she said. She says that she feels like her life, you know, needs to end. She says that, you know, she, she cannot take it anymore. And I said, you know what? It does sound like she's in trouble. Can you get to her, right? Can you get to her? And he was like, I'm going to try. I'm going to try, but she's refusing to come down. I said, never mind, you try first. You go to her house downstairs, right? And ask her to come down and meet you, right? The reason why was that, you know, if they are talking to you, they will not be hurting themselves, right? But she refused to come down. Ultimately, you know, half an hour passed, an hour passed. We were getting a little bit more worried about her. She stopped replying messages. And eventually, I, I made the call and tell him like, hey, you know, if you feel like you are, you know, she is really at risk, Right, then let's call the police. Right, and we got the police to come down, and the police knocked on her door, spoke to her. And the next message from her is this you know, that <laughs> did you call the police? <laughs> right, you know, in all caps. And, and he said, Yes, la, right, because I'm very worried about you and all that. You know, and she didn't respond to him for very long. And eventually, right, about half an hour in, right, you know, she was angry at him, but she said this her response to him was this. You know, they're bringing me to the hospital, you better come and visit me. So she kind of forgave him a little bit. But the truth of the matter is this, that the reason why she was being brought to the hospital was because she had plans to take her life that night. Right? And I want you to know this, okay, that when you look out for your friends, if they are not safe, right, you can, you know, take action, right, that can save someone's life. Yeah. Next will be, are they in distress? Right? So let's talk about distress. Let's talk about three types of distress. The first type of distress is emotional distress. Talking about feeling overly anxious or worried. And I'm not just talking about anxiety and worry that comes the day before the exams. Right? Or the day before like your assignments due. No, no, no. I'm talking about overly anxious or worried all the time. Many of us, you know, there are nights whereby we cannot sleep. You know, there are nights whereby, you know, we are anxious and worried, many things, right? Maybe tomorrow I got a big presentation to, you know, my boss. You know, maybe tomorrow I want to tell the girl that I like, that I like her, right? Anxiety, worry, right? is very real. But what happens is that when we talk about overly anxious, is this person anxious and worried for a long period of time? And it's not normal for them. Is this person 
anxious and worried over little things, right, that they shouldn't be anxious and worried about. Yeah, that's something that we want to kind of think about as well. Then we want to think about angry outbursts, irritability, irritability, excuse me, right, or restlessness. You know, that's very real as well. Yeah, so emotional distress, we're talking about this happening, right, all the time. You're talking about sudden mood swings, right? Suddenly they're okay, suddenly they're not okay. You know, but this is the last one or rather the one, right, that I would encourage you to look out for the most. Avoiding friends and activities that they once enjoyed, right? We call it this anhedonia, right? And it's very real because this is one of the most common symptoms of a mental health issue that they will start to withdraw. They will start to not appear when your friends meet. You know, they will, you know, if you tend to game with them all the time, right? They suddenly stop you know, wanting to gain because they, they feel like there's no point, right? If you used to shop, you know, go shopping all the time or you used to play basketball with them or even, you know, right, even being at work with them and they used to, you know, just really enjoy the work that they do and now they don't enjoy it anymore, right? That's a very real thing to look out for as well, that they are avoiding friends and activities that they once enjoyed, Yeah. Next, we can talk about feeling sad, empty, numb, hopeless, helpless, and worthless. But the reality is, right, when we think about this, unless they tell you, you know, we cannot identify this. But what we can identify, right, would be people who, you know, stop hanging out with us, who stop reaching out to us, who stop, who stop playing games with us, who stop, you know, who stop even talking to us. And that's something that we want to kind of be aware about as well. So emotional distress. Right, then we think about physical distress, right? Physical distress, of course, when you look on the left side of the screen right now, we, are, we can talk about self-harm. But not everybody harms themselves. But they still can be in physical distress. So you think about changes in energy level. They are slow, right? They are slow, right? They are, they are, they are tired all the time, right? Changes in eating too much or too little. And this is something that you can identify as well. All of us, many of us, right, our, our appetites are affected when we are under distress or stress. Yeah, but, you know, when we think about changes in eating too much or too little over a long period of time, right, this is something that we want to be a little bit more aware about. It could be an eating disorder. Changes in sleeping. And this, right, my friends, is the easiest thing to identify. Just now, emotional distress, right, withdrawal, not doing things that, you know, avoiding things and people that they once enjoyed, right? And we think about physical distress, changes in sleeping. Yeah. And the easiest question to ask them when they look tired is, how are you coping? And the response is, it's tired, but I'm okay, right? Ignore that I'm okay. Ask more about why you're tired, right? Like, so, hey, what's causing you to be so tired? You know, what's making you so tired right now? So changes in sleeping. Why? Because insomnia, right? Insomnia or sleep issues are the number one most common symptom of a mental health disorder. And in fact, even people who don't have a mental health disorder but have insomnia, research shows that almost 50% of them will go on to develop a mental health issue. Right? So changes in sleeping, too much or too little. And recently, you know, I, was, I was reading an article today, right? Just today on Yahoo News. Right, sorry, I know. I <laughs> shouldn't be reading Yahoo News. But, you know, on Yahoo News, right? You know, there's an article that said that people who sleep five hours or less every night, you know, are at risk of other issues, physical issues as well. So, changes in sleeping, when you think about physical distress, and why is it so? Because the reality is this, that when we think about someone who's struggling with a mental health issue is this. When they are asleep, when they're alone at night, they are alone. There is no one there to distract them from the struggle that they have in their mind. When they are alone, there is no one there to tell them that it's okay. And we call depression a 3 a.m. problem because at 3 a.m. in the night, right, in the wee hours of the morning, that is when the thoughts you know, the sounds, the voices get the loudest, you know. And we can, real, you know, we can really think about, you know, sleep in and of itself affecting everything else. It will affect our concentration, right? Of course, in the day itself, you know, if I have very strong thoughts, 
right? Depressive thoughts, or even I'm seeing things, hallucinating, all those kind of things, right? You know, they will affect our concentration. They will affect our memory. They will affect our ability to think clearly. But the most common thing that affects all these things is the fact that I'm tired. I've not slept. I've slept very little. I've actually literally worked with a guy before, you know, and I brought him to the a &E because he told me that I've not slept in three weeks. I was like, that is, that is life-threatening. Like. You know, that's life-threatening. And at a and &E, he fell asleep while standing and he fell, right? I had to kind of catch him. You know, and the reality, right, is this, that someone who is in distress, sleep is a big issue to look out for, okay? So next, we think about being unable to complete tasks, the sudden decrease in your school or work performance. I think it's very real there, yeah. So, physical distress. Then there are serious signs. And I, I want to say this, okay, I'll talk about look, listen, link, right? The moment you see serious signs, link straight away, all right? call for help, get, get people to come in, bring them to the hospital if you need to, right? So the first serious sign is this, thought of plans to kill or hurt themselves or others. Running away from home. Earlier on, I told, a, I told a story about a girl who ran away from home, right? That's definitely a serious sign, right? We didn't know until then that she was being abused. Next, being overly suspicious or fearful. And that is a sign of maybe someone who's hallucinating. You know, I, you know, or having delusions. I used to work with a lady Right, who, you know, when I was in a family service center, I used to work with a lady who, you know, her son had mental health issues and we were working with her on that and all that stuff, right? But along the way, I also realized that she was struggling as well because of one thing that she told me. And she said this, you know, Asha, I think, right, I think that my neighbors are planning to rob me. I'm very scared, very worried. I was like, why? All right, why? Tell me more, right? Tell me more. So, you know, when we think about that, tell me more, right? I was like, okay, tell me who is it, right? That, you know, is, is going to rob you. And she said, all my neighbors, all your neighbors. Not just the one opposite you. The one says, right? The one that says, and she's like, all of them. And that is when I realized, right? That she, you know, was delusional. At that point in time, we, we tried our best to get her, you know, to help. Uh, unfortunately, because she's a full-grown adult, right? I couldn't, I couldn't force her to go see the hospital, right? Or to go see the psychiatrist. So, all I could do as a social worker back then, excuse me, is to go to Mustafa and go and buy the fake CCTV camera right, and put it outside her house, right? To kind of ease her, her burden a little bit, her worry a little bit, you know. And that kind of brings me to the next thing, you know, to worry about, which, which we call it psychosis: hearing voices, seeing things that no one else can see or hear. Yeah. We also see things like sudden personality changes that are bizarre out of character, you know, and that is very much linked to also unexplained changes in thinking, speech, or writing. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I do is that I, I do a lot of trauma work, you know, and that's the area in which I'm the most trained in. Um, and, and one thing that we do realize and recognize is that, you know, people... Uh, especially young people who struggle with traumatic incidences, um, sometimes very severe traumatic incidences tend to develop this, this uh, condition called uh, DID, right? Disassociative Identity Disorder. And that's something that, you know, they develop alters, you know, alters, you know, their, their other personalities, right? You know, to protect themselves. And this is something that really you need a therapist to come in and support. Yeah. So if you happen to know somebody who suddenly changes in personality, suddenly changes in thinking, speech, or writing, right? This is something that you will need to kind of like act on already. Yeah. So, let's talk about this then. How then do we communicate with them? That's a big question, right? I go up to them and tell them like, hey, you got a problem, I need to talk to you, right? No, cannot do that, right? So the reality is this, when you think about communication with someone who is struggling, right? It all starts with me, right? My communication with them. You know, it starts with that, that one, you know, that one conversation that asks like, hey, dude, are you okay? Then it continues on, right? In that therapeutic relationship, like how do I continue to help them? How do I talk about my boundaries, you know? And when we think about this, right, we also need to remember that the way we communicate is important. So you don't just want to talk about verbal communication or vocal communication or visual communication. You know, when we look on screen here, right, today, right, 
Um, I'm going to get you to do this with me at home. All right. I, I want you to kind of put your hand up in front of your face. Okay, I'm just get you to move it from left, right, to left, to right, right. And create an okay sign. All right. So I want you to do the okay sign and follow after me. I want you to put it on your chin. I said chin. All right. So you know whether or not you did it wrongly or you know whether or not you, you put it on your cheek or your chin, right? But the reality is this, that when we communicate with people, I think this is something that we really want to kind of do this, right? Whereby we, you know, it's not just the words that are important, but the way we look, the way we express ourselves, the way we communicate visually as well, right? I can tell you I love you, but with a big frown on my face, you know, so it starts with the visuals. And I'm going to say this, okay, that it starts today. It doesn't just start when they're struggling, but it starts today. And the reason why I'm saying this is this, that people don't care how much you know until you know how much you care. And how do you know how much you care? You have to communicate it to them. All right, you have to communicate it to them. And it starts today with the way we communicate with them. All right, so brings me to the next point which is listen. Look and listen, right? Two L's. There'll be a third L later on. How then do I start? How do I start that conversation? All right, I'll say this. Be relaxed, be friendly, be concerned. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. You don't have to panic because if you're panic, it's very difficult for them to kind of, you know, to, to kind of like converse with you and talk to you and tell you, right? So be relaxed, be friendly, be concerned, right? Come in and just let them know, like, hey, you know, I want you to know that I'm worried about you. You know, I'm I'm concerned that, you know, you're not doing okay. You know, as a friend, your mom, as your family member, you know, as your brother, you know, as your classmate, as your as your colleague, you know, I, I just want you to know that I'm worried and I want you to be okay. So how can I help? All right. Be relaxed, be friendly, be concerned. Then open up by asking questions like, how are you? All right, what's been happening? I like to ask this recently. How are you coping or how are you holding up? All right, I think all of us have gone through a crazy pandemic. Right? And, and all of us are doing our best to kind of hold ourselves up you know, in many ways. So how are you holding up? All right, how are you? What's been happening with you? And listen for their response. And think about it. If their response is, I'm okay, just very tired. There's a sign already, right? To kind of like go in and ask them like, hey, why are you so tired? Yeah. So start. Then mention specific things that make you concerned. I think that's very key as well. All right. How then, you know, do I justify that conversation? And very often, right, people tend to hide their issues. They do. They hide their issues. And, and you know, if, if they had the opportunity, have the opportunity to kind of tell you like, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, right? You know, then bring up like, you know, this is why I'm worried about you. Yeah, and if they know that you care about them, right, that will be the start of that conversation. Yeah, and of course, when you think about verbal, vocal, or visual conversation, like communication, right? 55% visual, right? 38% vocal, the tone of voice, the way you look, your body language when communicating with them, right, really plays a huge part when you have this initial conversation, right? Cool. So next, what do you do? We leave it open. Not everybody is going to answer you immediately. Not everybody is going to be okay with like, oh, yeah, you know, I have all these problems and I can tell you now. Not everybody is going to be willing to accept help. And that's real. Because early on, I mentioned, right, up to two-thirds of people will not reach out to a professional for help. But, you know, out of those two thirds, how many of those actually will not be open to their friend helping them, right? So, if they don't want to talk, it's okay. It really is. It's really, it is really okay, right? If they don't want to talk, it's okay. Yeah, leave a line, right? Leave a line. What do I mean by leave a line? Tell them you're still concerned that you care about them. You know, when I was in NS, we learned, or I learned, right? Life-saving skills. And one of the things that we learn is this, that when someone is struggling and really struggling in the water, it may not be the best of you know, best thing to do to dive in and try to pull them to shore because they'll pull you under. All right. So one of the things that we learn is that what we can do is 
throw them a line. It could be a long rope. It could be, you know, a floaty. It could be something. Throw them a line, right? And when they are struggling, the moment they feel, they see it coming, right? If they are able to grab hold onto it, they'll grab hold onto it. And sometimes people are not ready to grab hold onto the line that you throw to them. But it's okay, you know, the line is still going to be there. Let them know I'm, I'm worried, I'm concerned, I care about them, and I'm open to talk anytime. Right? And don't confront them about it. Don't you tell them like, hey, you got a problem, like, I need to talk to you, right? Talk to me, listen to me, right? Right, don't do that. You know, avoid the confrontation, provide them with the support, let them know that I'm here anytime. Yeah? And this, this is what I mean by opening a line to talk whenever they feel like they can. Yeah. Cool. Then, more importantly, uh, listen with an open mind. I think this is very important, you know, for us, right? It's very key. And one of the, mo- one of the biggest turn-offs, right, that I've heard from young people, actually not just young people, everyone, right, is that people who ask them what's wrong rush in and try to give them advice or answer to a problem. And I think that's not what they want to hear. Generally, someone who is struggling, who have heard it all already, they have gone online to search already. They know what, what they need to do. Right? They, they've heard advice a million times from their parents, from their boss, from everyone. Right? But what they don't need, right, is for someone to come in and give advice. <laughs> yeah? But what they need is someone to come in and listen. Listen, to empathize, and to care. And what I said earlier on still holds true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you can, right? So don't just run in to answer and give advice. And sometimes I realize this, I recognize this, you know, that someone who jumps in to give advice, right, is not trying to soothe their friend or soothe the other person. They're trying to soothe themselves, the discomfort that they feel, right, listening to another person's problem, right? And I want to solve it, yeah. But that's not always our role, yeah? Next, don't judge their experiences. Sometimes it might not be a big deal to you, I think of a young person, right? A young person struggling with something, right? It's not a big deal to you, right? Because for maybe, maybe many of us, you know, we are more advanced in age, right? We've gone through it. We've, we've been there. We've done that. It's okay. <laughs> Excuse me, right? It's okay. But we think about it. To some people, right? Some things might be more important to them than they are to us. So don't judge your experiences. Yeah. And recognize that people who are struggling can struggle for many issues. And this is important. If they need time, sit patiently with the silence. Can I just say this? I have a friend who, when I was in secondary school, struggled a lot with his mental health. He, he lost his mom, right? And I happened to be the friend, right, that, that would, you know, that would reach out to him. And I realized that along the way, just talking to him and talking to him and talking to him didn't help. It really didn't help. But what helped was to sit with him Right, to sit with him and sit patiently with the silence, to hear, you know, what he was, you know, sometimes not even here, you know, just sit with him and be there with him. And the presence of, you know, my presence there with him, just a friend being there with him, he told me it made all the difference. Yeah. And years later, you know, he found me on Facebook after, you know, secondary school and all that. He told me that, hey, Asher, I just want you to know, right, that I just appreciate you. And I just thank you for all that you did for me. Back then. And I think back, right? I never do anything. <laughs> I mean, sit down with him, right? I spent time with him. And that's all I did. Yeah. And I sat with the silence. You know, as a social worker, as a therapist as well, very often we work a lot with silence. Yeah. And and uh some of the things that I often tell myself is I should shut up, I should shut up, I should shut up, right? <laughs> don't talk, don't talk and jump in because they are processing it even in the silence. Yeah. And I have had I have had times where I sit with a client. For two minutes, three minutes, five minutes in silence, all right? And finally, an epiphany happens and they start talking about everything, right? They were struggling with, right? And, and I, I want you to know this, okay? That, that silence can be very helpful as well. Just to prove and show that I am there for you, okay? Now, sometimes you need to encourage them to explain to you, right? So there are times where by someone is struggling and they talk, you know, and... and, and and they're telling you things that are out of context, right? 
you know, I, I know that sometimes it can be annoying and frustrating, irritating, right? But it's something that I've heard many, many times. Like, hey, explain, le, give me context, le, right? Don't, la, don't, right? Um, what I encourage you to do is to ask them to tell me a little bit more. Can you tell me more? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it this that you're struggling with? You know, is it because of this? Can you tell me why you're struggling with that? You know, why is it so important to you? Yeah, encouraging them to explain. And that will give them an opportunity to collect even, like, even more things off their chest. Yeah. And listen actively. You know, I'm not going to turn this into an active listening like masterclass because there are many of those. But when we think about listening actively, we need to also think about these three very important skills. First one is repeating to them back, you know, repeating back to them what they said to us. You know, recently I've been struggling. I, I've, I've not slept for a long time. I feel like every time I sleep, right? I get like mess. How do I repeat? It sounds like you've been struggling. You know, and, and you've, you've not slept well, right? You okay? How do I paraphrase? All right? Paraphrase by saying like, you know, so it feels like your sleep hasn't been good, huh? Yeah, and you're doing okay or not. You know, how's your, you know, how's your sleep quality like? You know, is it because you are having nightmares, you know? And, and what are those nightmares about? All right, so paraphrasing means that I'm replying in my own words. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounds like you and your wife have been going through a very tough time. You know, I think that you know, it, 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 it's not easy. But it feels also to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, right, that you guys have not been communicating. And you mentioned that earlier on, right, that you guys haven't really been talking. It's paraphrasing. Responding, right, really just be responding, law. responding to their, 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 you know, whatever they say. They can respond with a, mm, oh, you know, even a raising of your eyebrows. Yeah, just respond that way. Mm. All right, having a verbal response. And that's listening actively. In fact, and tell you about a girl that I know, you know, she did her master's in counseling at the same time that I was doing my 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 social work, like, like you know, degree and, and all that. And it was interesting because she was telling me about um, how when she was, you know, doing her internship. Intern, uh, just do her master's first time, right? There was a girl, it's a lady that walked into the family service center, right, and was in distress. And she happened to be the one that was there at the counter that day. And no one else was available, so she had to go and attend to the lady. So she sat down with the lady, right? All she did was, mm, oh, ayo. Mm, right, just responding like that, you know, responding like that. And the interesting thing is that about an hour later, the lady's in tears, right? right? Talk, talk about her hour, right? An hour later, her supervisor came in, you know, heard what was going on, sat in, continued the session to the last half an hour. And at the end of the day, he asked her, you know, the lady, you know, would you like to continue sessions with us? We can provide that support for you. And she said, yes, I would like to, but I would like her to be my counselor, right? And she did nothing. All she did was, mm. <laughs> right? So when we think about it, you know, just being there to sit in the silence, just being there to listen, right? To respond plays a huge part and it helps the person feel hurt. Yeah. Next, help them to calm down. You know, I'm going to teach you some techniques right now. Okay. So I'm going to teach you some techniques. The first technique is what we call one, two, three, four. And I, I just want you to kind of just think about it right, right now. Is there something around you that you can see? All right. One thing. Just one thing. I want you to just focus on that one thing. You know, what can you see? Can you describe it in your head as vividly as possible? What does it look like? Are there any imperfections? Are there any cracks? What color is it? You know, how does it look like to you? How does it make you feel? Right. What do you see? Good. All right. 
So I want you to not just think about what you see, but is that thing making a sound? If it's not making a sound, it's okay, right? We can step away from that thing and just kind of center yourself. And ask yourself, what are two things that you can hear right now? For me, I can hear the whirring of the aircon. And I can hear the cars going by downstairs, right? Those are the sounds I can hear. What are two sounds that you can hear? I want you to just sit with them for a little while. Try to tune into them. Take a deep breath. All right. Right now, I want you to put your hand on your chair, on your shirt, on your table, you know, whatever is around you right now. Can I just get you to focus on three things that you can feel around you? right now yeah i want you to just take a you know a minute kind of register the texture on your mind if you can touch the thing that you were seeing the first one right the first item that you could see feel free to use that item as well and touch it how does it feel is it hard is there a texture right what's the temperature of the item how does it make you feel holding the item? You know, if you have nothing around you to touch, you can grab your t-shirt like that, right? And rub your finger back and forth. You know, in and of itself, that is a grounding technique already. Right? Just holding and rubbing and letting it, you know, feel, you know, how does it feel in your finger? Is there any warmth that is going down your thumb and your, and your index finger right now? So those few things. And the last one, will be what are four things I can write down right now about my environment, about my situation. You know, four things that I can write down on a piece of paper, right? Just to kind of sum up everything that I've just experienced. Yeah, maybe I can say I can write down and describe the clock that I was looking at and the sound that I was listening to, right? And the thing and the, and the texture of the thing that I felt. So one, two, three, and four, right? You don't have to focus on all of them. Sometimes just even focusing on one is good enough. So that's grounding. That's a grounding technique. Yeah. There are many different kinds of grounding techniques. That's just, this is just one of them. All right, cool. Next is a distraction technique. So if I need to distract someone, maybe they're having an anxiety attack. Maybe they're having, you know, they're, they're very worried right now. Get their mind off it. Get them to calm down from 100. But don't just calm down from 100. Count down from 100 in multiples of 3. 100, 97, 94, 91, right? 80, 88, right? You know, you see how difficult it is? <clears throat> Just getting them to distract themselves. Yeah, counting down from 100 in multiples of 3. Then we think about a breathing technique. I'm going to teach you one breathing technique right now. Very easy one, okay? Um, and it's what we call cycle breathing. So if I could just get everybody to just do this together with me, just for a minute, just breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And breathe in through your nose and count to four. One, two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. And breathe out. Two. Three, four, and hold. Two, three, four, and breathe in. Two, three, four, hold. Two, three, four, and breathe out. Two, three, four, hold. Two, three, four, and in. Two. Three, four, focus on my count. Hold. Two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 
One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, and come back to me. All right. So that's a breathing technique. Um, you can do this. It will help you sleep if you have trouble sleeping. Right, you can do that as well. Right, you can do grounding as well. Now, I just kind of want you to kind of remember this. Okay, that if someone is in a high level of distress, the easiest way, right, or the only thing you can do is distract them. Yeah, I mean, from whatever I'm teaching you right now, right. Out of the three, use distraction. If someone who is um in a you know after they are done with the distraction, then do the grounding with them. Yeah, and finally, you can end off with a breathing technique to calm them down. If someone who is maybe not in a lot of distress, but feeling, you know, mentally not, not the best, right? Maybe stress, maybe they are not super overwhelmed, but they are starting to get overwhelmed. Then grounding and the breathing techniques will work very well in those situations. Yeah, if someone cannot sleep, you can always focus on the breathing techniques as well. So these are all tools that you can use to help people calm down. All right. Now, let's talk about confidentiality then, which brings me to the last L, which is link. Look, listen, link, right? But before you link, I think something that we need to always remember is confidentiality, right? And when people believe you and trust you, that you know, trust that a relationship is confidential, that everything that they share with you is confidential, they will be more and more willing to open to you or open up to you. So some of the few things to remember is this. Confidentiality means that information shared within a relationship will not be shared outside. And we don't share other people's personal details unless they've given you the express permission to do so. And the last one is this. Confidentiality is not absolute. There are times where we need to breach and break the confidentiality because we need to save a life. And this is important to kind of address if we can, you know, early on in a peer relationship, let them know like, hey bro, I just want you to know, right? You know, if I ever get too worried about you, you know, I, I promise that I won't be telling anyone about things that you tell me. But if I get too worried about you, you know, and you know, for example, you tell me you want to take your life, all right? I'm going to have to step in, okay? I'm going to help you, right? And you save your life, protect you because, you know, you're important to me, all right? So, having that, con that conversation early on is, is important, right? We are very clear about that, right? You know, it allows you to kind of continue the conversation with them. And the times whereby breaching that confidentiality will save a life. Like what I was talking about my friend, right? My friend was telling me about how, you know, he, he you know, he had a friend that was, uh, that was planning to take her life that night. And, you know, I asked him to go down to her house and all that. In the end, he had to breach confidentiality, not just to me, but breach confidentiality to, you know, to the police, right? But he saved her life. You know, he kept her alive. And she is still alive today. And she, she would have ended her life that night, you know, that two or three years ago. So I want you to know this, okay, that sometimes, you know, breaching confidentiality can be very, very crucial. And that's what I mean by link. You know, we don't only link. La, right? We don't only link when, when we have to breach confidentiality. But, right, we, we also definitely have to link, right, when someone you know, is, is experiencing these things. So, for example, at imminent risk of harming themselves, plans to attempt suicide, um, do I need to breach confidentiality if someone is cutting themselves, for example, or self-harming? Uh, that is, you know, dependent on the severity of the self-harm. But definitely, if you're thinking about plan to commit suicide or attempt suicide, right, to complete suicide, you know, at imminent risk of harming themselves, we need to kind of tell someone. You know, at imminent risk of harming others, you know, for example, they want to hurt someone else. Right, they, they, you know, 
we, it, it becomes a, you know, I want to like kill my teacher, for example. You know, there's, there's a girl that we, we worked with a couple of, uh, like I would say two years ago or, or one year ago. Um, she came in with issues of psychosis, right? So we were working with her on that. And, you know, she was saying that, that uh, you know, my parents are cutting my hair in the middle of the night when I'm asleep. So, you know, we, we tried to get around that and, and all that stuff, right? But one of the things that, that we realized was that it became my parents are cutting my hair at night. It became my parents are going to kill me, right? And we were very concerned and very worried, right? And it went from my parents are going to kill me to before they kill me, I kill them, lah. That was when we had to step in, right? And we had to send her to IMH. Yeah, so, you know, at imminent risk of harming others. I think that's very key as well. Next, also very important and definitely, right, I think this is something that, that uh, we, we need to kind of step in at this point of time, right? If they are being subjected to ongoing domestic violence, abuse, or if they are being forced to take drugs, for example, yeah, I think this is something that we, we definitely need to step in to kind of help, even if it's just to help a friend. Yeah. So, who can we call? Right. These are some places that we can get support from. If you look over here, you know, we have uh, the school counselors if they're young. We have limitless if they are under the age of 25, 25 and under. We have Tinker Friend if they're 12 and under. Right, we have IMH check if they are between the age of 16 to 35. Um, we have resilience at Shine if they live at the West. Care Corner, you know, Care Corner does, if I'm not wrong, uh, I think the, the North area. Right, then we have Touch Community Services if they live in the Central area in Singapore. Right, we have EC2 if they need to talk to someone online. But if it's an emergency, right, if it's an emergency, SOS, right, IMH Emergency Helpline, or call the police. But what I always recommend is this. If you can do this, right, encourage them to go, right, to the hospital with you. Yeah. And if you feel that they are struggling and you're being overwhelmed right now and you don't know what to do, yeah, then that's when you encourage them and ask them, would you like to see a professional? And these are the links to all the different professionals you know, in Singapore today. There's also SMH, if you like to go and Google that, right? there's Clarity, but you know, if you need to, you can reach out to them. Now, what do I do if I think that my, my friend or family member needs to see a doctor, All right? Private, definitely, you can go, you know, short wait time, very expensive. But we can think about public and not, you know, not everybody needs to go to IMH lah. Right. If not, I think will exploit the seams, right? And then nobody will get help anyway. So, you know, they may not need to go to IMH, but they can go to any hospital and any hospital near you, especially if you live in Jurong, la, for example. You know, you definitely don't want them to go to IMH. La. So, what can you do, right? First things first, easiest way to get them psychiatric help is to go to a polyclinic. Or rather, cheapest way is to go polyclinic, right? So go polyclinic or walk into the A&E. Now, you walk into A&E only for emergencies, right? But if it's not an emergency and you feel like they're struggling and they're, you know, they're, they're, you're very worried about them, encourage them, go to the polyclinic with you, right? And, you know, at the polyclinic, you can talk to the doctor or they can talk to the doctor and encourage them, you know, if, you, if they are worried about going on their own, go with them. You know, sometimes you don't know the you know don't know the power of telling them like if you're worried, if you're scared of going alone, I go with you. Right. You know, I've seen so many young people, so many people, right, reach out for help just because their friends said that they will go with them. Yeah. So, you know, go to the polyclinic, tell the doctor that you're struggling, you know, that 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 you know, this person is, is overwhelmed and, you know, all the symptoms, right? Emotional symptoms, physical symptoms, for example. And the doctor, right, would then write a referral to go to see a psychiatrist or psychologist, you know, in the hospital, right? And when they go there, right, they'll be charged a public rate and not a private rate, which can be quite expensive and very hard to manage. Um, if anybody is worried about the cost of going to any of these services many of our services are free of charge 
uh, of course it helps to call in to double check and ask for sure at limitless uh, we do have a charge of one percent of your monthly salary um, but for many people the money salary is zero dollars because they're students right so one percent of zero zero la, right but you know when we think about about someone who you know who is worried about doctor fees for example you know that we have cpf if they're old enough to have cpf you know our, our medisafe our medisafe will pay 500 dollars for any um, psychiatric treatment you know every year yeah so you have 500 dollars and 500 dollars is it could be maybe like five or six um sessions at the psychiatrist and for many of us that's that's all that's needed in a year yeah um for those who cannot even afford that or for those who are younger and maybe the parents don't want to support or cannot afford to support right that's when we can bring in the that we can bring in the medical social worker whereby we have medi fund and they will be able to kind of pay for that as well yeah so many ways to seek help i think the most important thing is to link them somewhere and more importantly link them somewhere whereby they feel comfortable going yeah link them somewhere whereby they feel comfortable going okay cool so look listen so look out for distress look out for issues right look out for safety then listen to them have that conversation with them start that conversation and remember when you have that conversation i'm not just communicating with the words that i use but with the tone of my voice and also with my body language as well and especially on my face right and you know really just allow them to speak yeah and finally link link them to help if necessary that's how you have a friend guys right not that, not that difficult right so i'm gonna end off with questions and uh for those of you who are listening online or you're watching the recording we're going to be stopping the recording here but before you go right um, remember that we have our socials over here at uh, limitless.sg or if you want to kind of reach out to us on Instagram at we.r.limitless or even on TikTok at limitless.sg and you can feel free to kind of reach out to us for help or for any advice if you need to. All right. So thank you very much for tuning in and listening. I hope that you listen to the rest of the series and join us again next year for the Limitless Run. And if you feel like, you know, you would like to support the work that we are doing and that we're doing good work, right? Feel free to, you know, to donate to us either monthly or even a one-time donation at give.asia slash limitless. Thank you, everyone.